Well, hello, everybody. Uh, Jody Cross, Rob Rockman, and Pat Sabell coming to you from Vancouver and Georgetown and Barrie, Ontario. Welcome to the Worship God TGC Canada podcast. Guys, hello. Good to see you again. Hey, Jody. Jody. Brothers, it's uh, always good to talk with you. And uh, hopefully that we've got some fresh things that we want to share in this new year. I know that you guys are passionate about our topic today. And it really is uh, very essential and very core to what we're talking about. Our topic we're going to address today is gospel-shaped gatherings. Gospel-shaped gatherings, how the gospel shapes and affects our worship. So this is a, a podcast on worship, and uh, we are looking at the centrality of the gospel today and how it affects what we do. Guys, I was reading through uh, Genesis chapter 22 in the last couple of days through the RMM reading plan, and I almost couldn't get through it. Um, mm. Just again, Abraham taking his son, his only son, that phrase that re recurs three times in the text and laying him down and you know that's the first place in the english bible that the word worship is used and obviously what a picture on the mountain that god prescribed was mm -hmm. that sacrifice going to be given and uh as we know isaac survived and and uh, he was not sacrificed but there was another son who was not spared and i almost couldn't get through that text just my mm -hmm. heart welling up with mm -hmm. emotion of what it cost the father uh, and the submission, the humility of the son. Mm. And, you know, the uh, John Stott says the cross is the blazing fire at which the flame of our love is kindled. Uh, but we have to get near enough for its sparks to fall on us. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we think about our gatherings, there's a lot of things that can drive what motivates us. There's a lot of things that can be put it in into the the paper that becomes our worship service. There's a blank piece of paper. A lot of things we can talk about, we can sing about, that we can preach about, that we can do, but the cross is central to this. And um, Pat, I'm going to turn it over to you in one second. I, as I was thinking about this topic, I was thinking of Romans, how at, at uh, the end of chapter 11 in Romans, it just says that there's this great doxology of praise uh, from him and through him and to him are all things to him be mm -hmm. the glory. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it says in chapter 12, then, then the imperatives come, the indicatives are over. The imperatives say, you know, in view of these mercies in view of the gospel in view of what God has done, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. So the gospel does drive our worship and our responses. And, and you have a heart for this. Tell us, tell us your burden for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, just another quote to, to go along the lines of what you just mentioned there, Jody, a uh, man by the name of David Pryor, he says, there is nothing more profound than the cross of Christ. Mm. And we never move on from the cross of Christ, only into a more profound understanding of the cross of Christ. Mm. Nothing more profound than the cross of Christ. And um, I believe it was Brian Chapel who said uh, of, of the gospel, the cross of Christ, the gospel being central in our gatherings, that if gospel priorities do not determine worship choices, then people's preferences will tear the church apart. Mm. Um, and I think there's such a need uh, in a day and age where it seems that everybody has a preference. Um, you know, in the church, everybody has always had a preference. Um, and uh, we've seen we've seen worship wars. We've seen churches torn apart by uh, some of the craziest things. Mm -hmm. um, but but what you know, you think of all these uh, ministries like T four G Together for the Gospel or TGC. There's there's these you know various denominations, different denominations, but focused on the gospel. I would say in our churches, in our Sunday gatherings, there needs to be a priority and it needs to be the gospel and that should be determining how uh, the worship choices that we're building or else people's preferences are going to rush in and make a muck of our gatherings so yeah and i think a lot of people would agree they would go well yeah of course the gospel we're christians the gospel but maybe let's talk about like so what would it look like if the gospel wasn't driving centrally like the because we can all think well of course the gospel drives what we're doing but i think for example of like what if musical style drives our what we're gathering is doing you know we're chasing after an image of maybe what we want our worship to look like and really that drives everything it, yeah. it drives what songs we sing it drives 
the kind of preaching, you know, maybe we just really like elevation. And so we're really trying to emulate that, or we're trying to emulate, it doesn't matter whoever it is, that is actually driving ultimately mm -hmm. what your gospel, what your gatherings look like. And um, that can be one thing. What, what are some other ways, guys, off the top of your heads, you know, what are some other things that could drive our gatherings that's not the gospel? Yeah, like what motivates people to come? You know, Rob, as you're talking, I'm thinking about a ship without a rudder. So, yeah. you know, you've, you've got a boat. And if the wind blows this way, the boat goes this way. If the wind goes that way, the boat goes that way. It's, it's got no aim. It's got no purpose. And it's, it's lost its, its reason. And without that central gospel rudder, what are some other things? I think of, um, you know, why do people gather? Well, they can gather for the music. You know, the band yeah. is great. So I come for the music or I love my friends being there. I come for the people. I come for the experience. And all of those things are some people might say I come because it's my duty. I did it. My grandmother did it. My parents brought me to church. I still do it every Sunday. It's all duty driven. And, you know, all of those things in a sense, and I want to I want to be careful here, but they almost become golden calves that mm. the real thing is is substituted for something different and something else other than mm. the glory of God in Christ. Right. And right. it looks kind of good. Not that a golden calf look good. It looks good. It sounds almost right, but it it's not hitting the, the target. Mm. Yeah. And there's a constant, uh, there's a constant uh, drive in us to, to one up the, the last Sunday, because there's always the need to, do something that's going to be creative that's going to be bright that's going mm -hmm. to be that's going to attract people so that we could keep having more people come where you know when paul says i'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of god mm -hmm. <laughs> in it is the power of god uh I, I think there's there's something that you know not moving on from the power of god uh, but only into a more profound understanding mm. of that is where we have to build our churches on that. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that our people are coming. Yes. Should we have good music? Should we be intentional in the way we, we, we structure our gathering? Should we, should we want to be there for, for fellowship and, and, you know, prayer and receiving the word? Yes, we should. But we, we just want to make sure that the reason, the foundation of all that we do is, is Christ, uh, the gospel. Yeah, and even, may I, may I dare even venture out to scary waters and say, even now when we're not allowed to meet, and there's yeah. a real frustration, and, and doesn't the Bible command us to meet and command us to gather, sometimes we can make meeting because we have to meet the priority and still not we're meeting to worship Christ. We're meeting because of the gospel. It's like even just that little change of focus can get us off from what we mean. Well, we got to meet because we have to, because God calls us to. Mm -hmm. Even that, I think, is just off point. It's we meet to gather together with the saints to fellowship with Christ and to worship mm -hmm. him and to remind ourselves to encourage one another with the gospel. That, that's yeah. the focus, worshiping God, encouraging one another, and anything that's off that, I think we start getting into scary territory. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Bible says that. I think of uh, Luke chapter 7, and Jesus said, one who loves much, the one who loves much is the one who's been forgiven much. You know, the, uh, you know and Pat, you said that too about the next big biggest thing, and, and uh, just kind of keeping the machine going, and one up, up and ship, and and, uh, you know, what, how do we stir people up? How do we motivate and excite people? Well, Jesus, you know, in this expression of exuberant worship with this woman who uh, lavished her love on Christ, uh, she had the understanding of, of his mercy and his love and her forgiveness. And Robert, you know, we talk about the fact that there's a tone in gospel shaped worship. The tone is, is grace and gratitude. Mm. The tone is gratitude for the grace that's bestowed. And if we don't understand the grace, yeah, the overflow of the gratitude, which is our outpoured heart, isn't going to be there. So, you know, if the music isn't good, if my friends didn't show up, if I'm not having a good day, the service is a bomb. <laughs> but if it's Christ at the center and gratitude for the grace of God in Christ, then it's always yeah. going to be, it's always going to be, you know, a joyful experience because we're rehearsing again the gospel. Totally. Right. Totally. Yeah. So I think one key thing that I think we need to, when we talk about, well, what does it mean to have a gospel shaped gathering? 
I think one thing that I would start off with saying then, and kind of just this perfectly sets it up is we need to know the gospel well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. we, we need to be, we can't expect that our gatherings are shaped by the gospel and that we're people like you're saying, Jody, who are, um, sh- you know, expressing this tone of great, if we don't understand the gospel. And yeah. I think that that's one of the biggest issues is if we're not fluent enough in, in the gospel and able to communicate it often to ourselves, to other people, then I won't be able to, how can I shape gatherings this way? I think, you know, like I won't know how to speak another language if I never study it. Right. Right. If I don't know the words and the phrases and the grammar and the exceptions to those rules. And I think for many of us, the gospel is simply, you know, like just Jesus died for me. Um, When we speak of the gospel, we're really just focusing on how we get saved. You know, it's a moment in period, period of time where Jesus died on the cross and rose again. And that's the gospel. And it's how our sins are dealt with, but the gospel is so much bigger. It's not just that Jesus died for us. The gospel is like the purpose and the plan of God in all of history. Mm -hmm. And we see that throughout like the biblical narrative. God made us in his image. He, he made us according to, to his, this triune nature that he has and he breathes life into us. And then Mm. we rebel. (laughs) We go, no, thanks. Don't like that. Uh, We're going to do our own thing and we wander off. And yet God still says, I'm going to provide a seed. I'm going to provide a way out. I'm going to provide salvation and human history continues. And we see sin and, and rebellion and God constantly being faithful and us constantly being unfaithful. And then finally at the right point in history, Jesus comes revealing the very image of God to us, dies, resurrects, gives, grants us the opportunity for faith in him. And then not only that, but a a kingdom is established, an eternal kingdom that we are a part of if we believe in him, that we have a purpose in and a plan in. Like the gospel story is so rich and wonderful. And if we aren't fluent in it and able to communicate it and and know it well deep in our souls and can preach it to ourselves and say it to others, I really think that it that's going to be, that's going to get in the way of us really having gospel Um, these gospel gatherings, gospel shaped gatherings. And I think it's very easy to see our role as worship leaders, as leading people in praise, but the gospel shapes how we do that, how we lead, how we see our calling, how we sing, what we Mm -hmm. sing. It's the foundation for everything. Yeah. Yeah. I I think of uh, Jerry Bridges book, which I would highly recommend Mm -hmm. the disciplines of grace. I think one of his chapters early on is preach the gospel to yourself every day. Um, and in reality, Christians are, if, if you think of a, a horse on the saddle, maybe that that sitting on the horse and the saddle is resting in the gospel, but we're usually falling off one side or the other of the horse. Uh, mm. We're falling off the saddle either into legalism. Um, and, and that's where, you know, we've read our Bible all week and we've had devotions, we've had prayer times, we've done a couple of good things through the day. And we're thinking God is super jacked. He's, <laughs> he's like really excited about me because I'm just, I'm killing it this week yeah. uh, with my walk with God. Therefore God is pleased. God loves me. Um, and then, you know, week two happens and we, th- the day gets away on us. We, now it's three days. We haven't read our Bible Uh, We snapped at our wife. We got angry at our children. All of a sudden, God is angry with me. Um, And and so so there's there's this you know there's there's license. We're 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 just like I'm just gonna sin because I know God will forgive me. There's this Mm -hmm. I you know I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be legalistic and I'm gonna do all these things because God will accept me. But in the middle is this beautiful reality that Jesus Christ has once and for all paid the debt for past, present, and future Mm. sins. Um, You know, uh, I think it was Sinclair Ferguson that said one of our greatest temptations is try to smuggle our character into (laughs) his already finished work of grace. If if there's a, a picture of the Mona Lisa 
and you could get to it and take a Sharpie and draw a mustache on the Mona Lisa, it would not complete that picture. That picture is already complete. And uh, sometimes when we're trying to do things to, to have God be pleased with us, mm -hmm. uh, it's like we're trying to add something to what he's already once and for all accomplished. Mm. And we need to get that deep in our souls because your greatest mm. temptation and my greatest temptation is to, to, to fall either into legalism or license. Mm. And when I stand in that place, resting completely in the finished work of Christ, uh, then, then the way I parent my, my children, the way I love my wife, the way I uh, am in relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ, the way I worship everything at the, at the, at the core, at the very foundation is the gospel from that. Mm. You know, we use a phrase a lot. Uh, I'm, we're, gospel, we're a gospel centered church. I think that's become a bit of a buzzword. Yeah. But I think we've really walked away and wandered away from what what truly being gospel centered is. And so if mm. we want to be gospel centered in our gospel shaped in our gatherings, we got to get the gospel and live in the good mm. of the gospel yeah. as a, as a family, as an individual, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to get that word in us and we need it to, 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 to dwell richly in us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's because, what the gospel does in the life of somebody who clings to it is it breeds dependency on, on Christ for everything, because I recognize right. my sinfulness and not in a, I'm, I'm constantly whipping myself kind of way, but in a Christ is my all Christ is my all. I think yeah. it's JC Ryle who says the man who doesn't glory in the gospel can surely know the little, know little of the plague of sin that is within him. So this is the thing is when I, when I'm, when I'm living in the gospel and the grace of Christ, I, I become very much aware of my limitations mm -hmm. and his excellencies right. and his glory, which then of course drives everything that I'm doing. And that is planning services. That's how I engage with my pastor or my friends or my spouse. So that gospel, that dependency on God that the gospel gives us, I think is essential, mm -hmm. especially as people who are planning and shaping these gatherings. Right. You know, and, and uh, our gatherings are going to focus on something. Somebody is going to be the star of the show. Yeah. Right. And, you know, there's going to be, and, and that's the trick with technology. That's a whole other topic, but yeah, with, with technology and skillfulness, somebody or something else can be, can take center place and become that, which is most attractive and most exciting and most praiseworthy. And I think it was George Whitfield that said, make much of Christ make much of Christ. And when we celebrate the gospel, we're making much of, of who Christ is. Spurgeon actually just talking about not adding anything to the finished work that he's done. Here's what Spurgeon said, all the love and the acceptance, which perfect obedience could have obtained of God belong to you because Christ was perfectly obedient on your behalf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just another way of saying what Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. There's nothing left for us to do to earn to merit God's salvation. We don't have to, there's no earning to be done. There's no merit to be achieved. It's receiving, accepting and responding. I think Louis Giglio said, uh, uh, worship is, is the response of all that we do, all that we say, all that we are all the time. And uh, keeping, mm -hmm. keeping this, this uh, gospel message clearly in our sights is what drives us and, and motivates us. And I, I love uh, Ephesians chapter two, <laughs> You know, these, this juxtaposition, we were dead, but we were alive. We were estranged from God. We we're reconciled. We were objects of wrath, uh, but now we are objects of his eternal love. And yeah. as you said, yeah. you know, you, you just, you never leave that. It's not like, yeah, right. I, I know that. Let's move on <laughs> to something more, more profound, more, yeah. uh, you know, more, uh, more exciting, more new, whatever. Yeah. Um, the gospel is that which will always be center and core in our lives. So, you know, I think we should just assume that just because we, you know, we call ourselves Christians, you know, we read from the Bible, uh, we sing Christian songs that were gospel centered. Is, is that, is that enough? I mean, the fact that we open the book and we're in the pages, is that enough? Or does our gospel centeredness mean that there's a specificity within Christian songs and, and Bible readings? Do we need to get deeper than that? Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, talking with someone not so long ago and I was telling them about a song and um, 
I said, are you familiar with this song? And, and uh, she said, no, you, you should send it to me. And so I sent it to her and, and uh, it was, it was speaking about, you know, the blood of Christ and what Christ accomplished on the cross. And she said, oh, that would make a great communion song. Um, <laughs> kind of implying that, you know, we should sing about Jesus and his death, his life, his death, his resurrection, kind of, you know, for communion. Um, and uh, I, I think often that can be in people's thoughts or in people's minds where, you know, I think about the worship of heaven and, and this is an ongoing worship service that, that literally what we're doing when we gather is we're joining that service mm. that's already in progress. And so, and that service already in progress, you know what they're singing up there? Revelation mm-hmm. five gives us this beautiful picture into yep. it. And, and we see that, that, that the lamb is worthy. That's what they're saying. And they're saying worthy is the lamb uh, who was slain to receive power and wisdom. And, and, you know, we, we see uh, every tribe, he has purchased a people from every tribe and every tongue. Um, and so, uh, if, if heaven's worship is the worship service that we're joining, uh, should, should not the, the, uh, the gospel, should not the, uh, the atonement of Christ, Christ uh, incarnation, Christ perfect life, Christ resurrection, Christ ascension, should that not be the, the focus mm. of our gathering? Should that not be the focus of our songs? of Mm. our preaching um should it not be the focus of our prayers and our scripture readings it 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 needs to be it jesus needs to be at the center so that he would be the one exalted so that he would be the preeminent one so that people Mm. would walk to the door that are you know i call it belly button gazing or looking inward and they're they're more aware you know maybe they 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 were in license all week and they Mm. fell off that side of the horse and, and, or maybe they're wrapped their eyeballs in legalism and thinking that Jesus loves them a whole bunch. They need a, a reality check with the yeah. gospel Amen. that reminds them, hey, guess what? <laughs> On your best day or your worst day, you're not any different. When he looks at you because right. of Jesus Christ, your Savior, and his mm. blood, he sees you as clothed in the perfect righteousness of his son and that should motivate you to worship and Mm. love him and respond john stott said this he said how can anyone be arrogant when they stand at the foot of the cross right and uh all arrogance is gone when we stand and we behold the one who has given Mm. his life in exchange for ours and Mm. man yeah that that sorry this gets me preaching a little i know this is great because that's man (laughs) like when you're gathering when you show up and and we can even talk a bit more specifically about what would it maybe look like to let the gospel shape our gathering but when you come in and the focus is not on me not again on what i'm doing or what i uh, you know, my thoughts, but rather I'm, I'm transported into like, I'm in a world all week, a pandemic of frustration, of sin, of, of yeah. darkness. I, I don't need more church time. That's just trying to give me a positive spin on that. What I need in my life as I'm battling sin is like you're saying, is to stop looking at myself. It's to remind myself of the narrative of the story, the redemptive story of God. I think I've said this on this podcast before. A lot of pastoral ministry is doing this. Like it's getting people to look up and to remind them, hey, I'm in a narrative. Like I'm in a narrative here. Right. And this narrative right. ends at Revelation when, when we're all together with mm-hmm. God in his kingdom, worshiping the lamb. He is our light. We don't need right. the sun. Like that's where we're headed. So where do I fit right yeah. now on that? And it's Christ. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. That's where I fit right, right now. It's Christ is everything. Christ is everything. Mm. And man, like we need more and more of that. And I can almost, I can, I can watch services and I can tell like, where's the focus. And I even, I'm Mm. very convicted myself when I'll plan a service and I'll go, Oh man, like, I think that was a little too me focused. And I wasn't giving that to my people. They needed Jesus. And I was giving them some cool songs and I was giving them some cool kind of things, tricks, but not Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
yeah this i, this... I think this sorry i was just gonna say i, th- I think up. this podcast needs to be part two jody <laughs> There's a whole lot to talk about here. Well, yeah, we're, yeah. we're able to do that. We get to talk about what we yeah. want to talk about. So let's do a part two. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Uh, Just talking about the narrative, you know, the gospel. And, and I'm actually just going to give you guys a little bit of a heads up. Let's, uh, I'm going to give you just a minute to think about this. How would you summarize the gospel? We'll come back to that in a sec. But just give it to us simply. As we talk about this narrative of the scriptures from beginning to end, we've been in Revelation we talk about the beginning of the gospel in Genesis 3.15, how God promised to send the seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. The gospel narrative is that, you know, God has, has saved us and done for us what we could never do for ourselves. And the salvation in the gospel is not just a past event for us, but it's in our experience, it's what's continuing to happen, that God has saved us, that he is saving us and he will save us. And I think of Romans chapter 8.30, just speaks of these past events and what our future is. Mm. So not only when we celebrate the gospel, are we looking at our salvation when we accepted Christ, when we came to know Christ, but what he did for us on the cross, but there's, there's a present and a future aspect. And here's what Paul says, those whom he predestined, he also called those he called. He also justified and those whom he justified, he also glorified. And there's the sense that this gospel hope, this gospel centeredness is actually what enables us to live every day. So Rob, you just said it, Mm -hmm. you know, what, what gets me going tomorrow morning after I've gathered with God's people? Well, there's a gospel hope. Colossians uh, chapter one says this, that this is the hope of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of tip my hand in terms of a definition of the gospel. And um, so putting it succinctly, if someone today says, you know, I'm a little fuzzy on what the gospel is. is. Is it the Bible? Is it the story of Jesus? Well, how would you, how would you brothers succinctly describe what is the gospel? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we think of creation, fall, redemption, um, consummation, or you, uh, a lot of, a lot of way, a lot of times I use in, in the gathering for, for thinking in terms of our liturgy or our structure the thought that God is holy, that we are sinners, that Jesus saves us from our sin, uh, and that um, Jesus sends us. Uh, so, um, but but the gospel in its simplest is that Jesus' uh, perfect life, his substitutionary death, uh, his resurrection, his ascension, is is all been. Uh, brought about so that i could be reconciled to god he's Mm -hmm. made it possible so that i could be in relationship with god jesus christ has paid it all um yeah yeah, it's interesting for for years at our church we used to tell uh, it was part of our new members class we would ask people to could you give me a a a gospel definition in, in a minute or less and it was it was devastating often to hear people's understanding mm. of the gospel or, or how they think of the gospel. And, and it goes to show you that something that we, we prize ourselves, like you said, Rob, we would probably all say we're gospel centered, or yeah. of course we know the gospel. Um, but, but do we really know the gospel? Oh, and, yeah. and, and I think before, before it gets into our gatherings, we need, we need a gospel centered community. Yeah. We need a gospel centered church. We need people that love the gospel and live the gospel. And therefore, when you come together, you celebrate the gospel. <laughs> you rejoice yeah. in the good of the gospel. Yeah. I, so. you know, my, my attempt at the gospel would be like, it's, it is God's, the gospel is God's plan in history to save and redeem sinners um, for his kingdom. Like there's this, there's this thread of God created us. He made us, we rebelled, but he didn't let us on our own. He has promised us Christ, sent Christ who has saved us through his substitutionary death, substitutionary death. And now he has called us into his kingdom and we are living and, and, and waiting awaiting that, but living in that. And so it's not just uh, Jesus died for me. It is literally like all of history, every day I'm living, the gospel has, I think part of the problem is a lot of us don't know how to apply the gospel into our lives right now. Like we don't know. So I'm dealing with right now, my wife and I are looking at trying to buy a house. Okay. So, well, how does the gospel 
like a lot of us don't think, well, the gospel applies to our fears around money and our concerns about the future. And, but the gospel, absolutely. If Jesus is on the throne, if he's working, if he's called us, if he's using us, that is total, right. that is complete implication on what home I buy yeah. or my worry about finance. The gospel completely applies to that. And yet, if we just think about Jesus died for my sins is the gospel, then we really struggle to become gospel saturated because we're very much just kind of stuck to that one note it's part of the story of the gospel absolutely and it's an essential part but it's not the whole story i just want to plug here this book it's a gospel fluency by jeff Mm -hmm. vanders vanders stelt um yeah it is a great book and it's essentially encouraging what we've been talking about i think we wanted to get through more in this episode and we're just loving this conversation but this conversation about (laughs) becoming gospel people the book is really about um, yes. Gospel Fluency by Jeff Vanderstelt. It's all about how do we come, how do we create a culture? Like you just said, Pat, how do we create a culture of worship yeah. in our church? Because yeah. it can't just be me. It can't just be my pastor. It's got to be my community who's living that way constantly. And that's right. that's a good yeah. theme for us to maybe wrap it up on it, just in terms of what we're going through. I would say that probably everybody who's watching in early part of 2021 would say that one of your concerns as a church leader is unity. Mm. And so let's end on what we started on today, which is what and what binds us together. What's our focus? What's mm. the glue that holds us and keeps us yeah. uh, oriented in the right way? Well, it's it's Jesus Christ, His cross, yeah. His work, His ongoing work, and His ultimate glory. Yeah. And so we sure need that in terms of figuring out what binds us together. It's the celebration of the life, death, and resurrection, and return of Jesus Christ in our lives. Yeah, I think it's Calvin who said the whole gospel. Yeah is in Christ. Like yeah. that's, that's kind of the, it's the story of Christ. He, he is like, that's why he's got to yeah. take front and center mm-hmm. of our gathering. Which is why Colossians one says that he is preeminent. He's the yeah. first, he's everything, right? Christ is all in and all. That's the theme of Colossians. And, and so, you know, as you leave today and we're going to come back because we do want to talk about this some more and process it and apply it to a gathering so what is this that we've talked about today yeah. look like when it applies to a 60 or 90 or 120 minute service mm-hmm. corporately? So how you, how you plan it, how you present it, how you sing it, pray it, preach it. Yeah. We want to talk about the gospel. So you're going to want to be sure to come back again. I would like to leave us with uh, the first verse of how deep the father's love, mm. uh, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure That is uh, just a wonderful reminder of the gospel. The love of the father gives his only son, uh, Genesis chapter 22, John 3, 16, to make us these rebels, his treasures, his much dearly loved children, heirs, heirs of the uh, heirs with the son, Mm. Jesus Christ. And so Christ is the name we honor and glorify. He's the Mm. reason that we're here. And uh, guys, thank you so much today for being with us and encouraging us. I'm going to have Pat, if you would just, we don't always pray out, but why don't you uh, just pray that Mm. the Lord would sink this down deep in our hearts and that um, we as individuals would be gospel shaped, motivated, saturated people that will in turn influence our churches. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Let me pray. Father, uh, forgive us if we have moved on from the cross. Mm. Um, uh, keep us from from moving on and let us if we move anywhere in only into a more profound understanding of the cross mm. um, father the worship that is ongoing that is that is happening right now is is centered on the one who is in the middle of the throne the lamb who was slain to receive glory and power and wisdom and wealth. And so uh, we, we want our lives when nobody's looking, we want our lives when we're with our families, we want our lives uh, in our parenting and our marriage relationship to, to be focused and centered on Christ. Um, And so would you help us? I pray, would you, increase our love for the gospel and let it Mm -hmm. let it permeate every aspect of our life 
truly teach us what it means to be a gospel-shaped, a gospel-centered people, I pray. And uh, Lord, we, we, we're we grateful that when we talk about thing, these things, our hearts are so mm. full uh, because you're amazing and your work on, on the cross for us was amazing mm. and uh, protect us from from this getting old or uh, us losing uh, just that that sense of just being overwhelmed and amazed in awe and wonder at the cross. Mm. Uh, we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks again, brothers. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being with us today. Uh, Lord willing, we will be back again soon, and we will talk about how to plan gospel-shaped, saturated worship services, gatherings where we come together around the gospel. So we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.